So today is, today's lecture, we're going to focus on normal forms. And I sort of, again, hyped this up last class, saying that they're kind of important. Uh, and I think they're useful for you guys to know, even though it is a bit theory-esque. Uh, the, the dirty secret will be, at the end, I will show that uh, although normal forms seem like a good idea, in practice, people don't really follow them. Most people probably don't even know the normal formers exist. Uh, and as we go along, you'll sort of see, you know, it's sort of complicated, right? We'll show how to do mathematical or apply algorithms to decompose schemas into uh, the proper normal form that we want. But in reality, most people don't even do this. Most people just wing it, and you end up with usually third normal form. And so the reason why I want to spend time discussing this is that there's going to be always new people coming out with new database systems. And they're going to make these new claims about how their new database system is much better than a relational database system, all the sort of traditional database systems. And in particular, the NoSQL guys are pretty guilty of this. And what the, by understanding the normal forms, you'll be able to sort of cut through the marketing fluff and actually understand at, at intrinsically what these systems are actually doing and whether their trade-offs that they're making in their data model, as well as other things, is actually a good thing or not for your application. So I'm not saying that NoSQL systems are bad or good because they don't follow the relational model. I'm just saying that they make certain trade-offs and in, in particular, in, in terms of the normal forms, that may not be appropriate for certain applications. So it's good to understand, you know, sort of in a principled way, what these things are actually doing. All right, so as I said on, on last class, the goal this week is really for us to, to try to understand what does it mean to have a good database design. So we're, again, we're dealing with this at the application level, right? It's you as somebody who's designing a database to store data for some new application you're building at your company or organization. And it, we're not really concerning ourselves just yet about what it means you know, on the inside of our system that we're actually going to build. What does that mean for us? What do we have to support? We'll get to that starting next week. But again, we need to understand what, what kind of applications people want to write in our database system. So the two definitions or two goals for, for do we want to achieve for having a good database are, are the following. The first is that we want to ensure that we maintain the integrity of our data. Meaning, we, if you put good, good data in, we want to get good data out. Right? If, if, if we put garbage data in, the, the data system can't magically make that, you know, clean that up for us. Uh, but we obviously don't want to put stuff in and then get back different things later. And then we also want to get good performance. And we are not really touching on that too much uh, in last lecture and this lecture, although it sort of crops up in, in certain cases when we talk about how we actually enforce functional dependencies. So again, this trade-off between correctness or integrity versus performance, this is a reoccurring theme in, in databases, and it's gonna come we're going to come across this multiple times throughout this, this uh, semester. But for our purposes here, we're really sort of focused on the first one here. We're, we're caring about the integrity. So today's uh, agenda will be spent all the time on the normal forms, we'll walk through the major ones, and then we'll spend a little bit at the end talking about what does it mean for a NoSQL system to not fo follow a you know, third normal form and then instead to denormalize their database. And we'll show what the sort of implications of that, both from the application standpoint, but also from a performance standpoint. So the last class, we spent time talking about functional dependencies. Right? We showed how that if you're given a schema, you're given a bunch of functional dependencies, we can then extrapolate additional functional dependencies right, using the, the Armstrong's axioms to compute the closure. And then we can start reasoning about what functional dependencies will be held or covered by a particular schema. So now what we want to do is now we want to take our, 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 our schema and our functional dependencies, and we want to search for what are called bad functional dependencies. And I'm putting bad in quotes because it does not necessarily mean that they are doing the wrong thing from the application standpoint. I really mean that they are difficult for us to enforce or may end up getting violated based on how we do our schema decomposition. So the idea what we're going to want to do is to do normalization is we're going to pick a, a, pick a, a, a table and then based on some rules as defined by our reasoning about the functional dependencies, we want to split them up into subtables. And then we sort of want to keep doing this over and over again until we end up with a what is called a normalized database. And normalized, it, uh, that term is actually a, is ambiguous, uh, sort of mathematical definition for what does it mean to be a normalized database. 
uh, other than as defined by the, the normal forms. So the way to think about a normal form is that it's a characterization or a, uh, or a, a way to, to reason about a particular decomposition for a schema in terms of the, the functional dependency properties that, that we, we talked about last class, and that when we put the relation back together using uh, natural joins, uh, we, we may or may not have certain anomalies, we may or may or not satisfy the properties we talked about before. So in last class, I didn't really mention this or what it means to do natural joins and put the decomposed relations back together, but what you end up doing is generating what's called the universal relation. So think about in your, in your database, if you just combined all your tables together and just made one giant table, in Cod's original paper, he called this the universal relation. Right? And we sort of showed, showed a few examples what, what this loader looks like, and you'll see why it's a bad thing. And then so for performance reasons and for just us reasoning about the data we have in our database, we want to do our decomposition into a, to a different normalization level. And then that normalization level, what properties it will guarantee are represented by what is called its normal form level. So the three properties we talked about last class were lossless joins, dependency preservation, and re redundancy avoidance. So I want to go through real, these at a high level real quickly again, just as, as a refresher, because it was at the end of last lecture. And then again, these will be important when we talk about each, each different normal form, which of these three properties do they, do they guarantee? Right, so the first decomposition property is the lossless joins. And then again, the basic idea here is that if we decompose a single relation into two separate relations or subrelations, that when we join them back together using a natural join, we won't generate any, any bad data, or dirty data, or, or noisy data, or in, incorrect data. Right? I showed an example where if you join a table back together, you all started having, started having uh, rows that didn't actually exist in the original or universal relation. And so if we want to decompose our tables, uh, we want to make sure that we don't have this property. And we said this was mandatory because we don't want to have data that shouldn't actually be there. And so the test for this is, is, is fairly simple. If you take the uh, intersection of either R1 or R2 for a decomposition, uh, you're either going to get back the uh, original relation or one relation R1 or R one relation R2. And if you have that, then you know you're guaranteed that you're not going to have any, any, any lossless joins. The next thing is that dependency preservation, and this one is, is pretty straightforward. The basic idea is that if you decompose your relation into different subrelations, there's no functional dependency defined in your provided set of functional dependencies that will span multiple, multiple relations. So if I have attribute x implies y and z, all three of those attributes, x, y, and z, will have to appear in a single relation. If it's split across multiple relations, then it's not dependency preserving. And again, we said that this was a nice thing to have, ideally, uh, but it was expensive to enforce because at runtime, you'd have to actually join the two tables uh, to see whether your, your, your function dependency is still valid, still holds. And so the way that we can test for this is that we just compute the closure, which again was the, the explosion of all possible functional dependencies given the provided ones. Again, we're using Armstrong's axioms to expand this set. And then we just check to see that uh, that for every relation in R1, the, the, the closure of the functional dependencies in R1 are covered by, by the relation. And the last one, which we were sort of ambiguous about, is redu redundancy avoidance. And the basic idea here is that you don't want to have repeated uh, attributes in your tuples, or sorry, attributes in, 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 a, in a single relation. All right? And we want to do this, obviously, because it's, it's a waste of space. And then we have the, the uh, problem where we may have an update anomaly where if we have a, a particular entity replicated multiple times across different tuples, if we have to change something about it, then we need, need to make sure that we update all of our, our tuples that have that repeated value. And so the test for this is pretty straightforward, right? For a given uh, uh, function dependency, x implies y. Uh, if x implies y is covered by a particular subrelation, rn, then x just has to be a super key of, of rn, meaning for a given value of x, you'll get a, a specific or unique value of y. If you don't have that, that means you'll have, you'll have uh, duplicates. So again, we'll, we'll, as we go through examples of the different normal forms, these different issues will come up. So the history of the normal forms is that it goes back to the very first paper from Ted Codd in 1970. And in that first paper, he reasons about the universal schema, 
which is just sort of the, the, the giant single table of everything that's in, in your database. But then he also talked about the, the first normal form. And then later on in 1971, he then defined uh, the second normal form and the third normal form, um, which again has is a more restrictive, a more refined approach of the first normal form. And then in 1974, he teamed up with this guy, Ray Boyce, who was at IBM Research, and they defined what's called the Boyce Cod normal form, which is a sort of a, a, a refinement or restriction, a more restrictive version of the third normal form, but sits in between the fourth normal form. Uh, and so then, then they came out a paper in 1974 that defined this. So um, Raymond, or Ray Boyce, he was actually one of the co-creators of SQL, along with Don Chamberlain at IBM. And then he died of an aneurysm in 1974. So his last paper was, was the, the Boyce Cod normal form paper. So if you Google his name, you see all these old dudes that are clearly not him because he died when he was 27. Um, okay, so that's the history. So again, the, it, the normal forms are, again, a part of the original relational model work. It, there's a lot of work in this area in information theory that we're not really going to cover. Um, but the main ones that we're going to focus on here or that are in the textbook are the seven normal forms that you have here. So the way to sort of uh, understand this list is that as you go from the top to the bottom, you end up with more restrictive schemas, meaning there's more uh, properties that have to be enforced or guaranteed by your schema in order to reach a certain normal form level. So the, the two that we actually really only care about in the real world are the, the two guys in the middle here, the third normal form and the Boyce Cod normal form. These are the most common that you actually see. This is what people normally try to achieve when they do database design. Uh, and again, the dirty secret is that if you just take you know, an ER diagram and convert it to SQL, you end up usually in third normal form. So you don't like to do anything special to get there. It's just there is a mathematical definition for what it means for your schema to be in the third normal form. The first normal form is just when you have a single table and you, 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 you don't have any um, you don't, all, your, all your attributes are atomic, and you don't have any groupings, which I'll show what that looks like in a second. The second normal form, depending on who you talk to or what textbook you read, they say this is obsolete. They say that people don't, shouldn't do this. But in practice, I think there was a survey maybe 15 years ago where a, 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 a scientist went and looked at actually real-world database schemas, and a lot of them end up being in second normal form, right? because it's just sort of good enough. We'll see what it means, what, what, what can happen when you're in second normal form. Uh, but a lot of times people just, just do this and it is what it is. For the fourth and fifth normal form, this is basically multi-value dependencies. We don't need to really worry about this. Uh, it's, if you're curious, it's in the textbook. I can't give you actually a formal definition because I don't care because I've never had to do fourth and fifth normal form. But you know, just want to say that it, it does exist if you want to learn more at the textbook. Then later on, there's this thing called the sixth normal form. And now you're starting to get into like weird stuff, right? This is like, now you start to get into like hardcore like information theory that has no real practice in the real world. Um, I don't think there's a seventh normal form, but there are a bunch of additional normal forms beyond this uh, that have come out over the years. And again, so you have domain key normal form, elementary key normal form, and so forth. So you can sort of see the years that these things were sort of proposed. And again, there's no database system that I'm aware of that actually can enforce all of these things, or right? all these sort of esoteric normal forms. This is sort of like you know, stargazing done by theoreticians about, oh, the database could do these things, right? Or, or these things have certain properties that maybe people actually care about. But in practice, nobody does these things, and everybody cares about you know, mostly the, 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 the middle guys here. And again, typically by default, you end up in the third normal form. All right? OK. So another way to think about this, again, is, is it's a hierarchy, where if you're in one, if you're in a higher level normal form, then you're automatically in the other, the other normal forms. I don't know about the, sort of the, the more ther theoretical ones, but at least from up to 1NF to 5NF, whatever sort of level you're in, you're also in the other level. So if, you're, if your schema is 3NF, you're also 2NF and 1NF, right, and so forth for, for the other ones. And again, the ones we care about are the ones in here because these have, these are actually the most practical. And then from a, from a human standpoint, from a common sense standpoint, to me, they, they make the most sense, right? Whereas the other ones are uh, a bit mathy than I would like. All right, so let's start with the first normal form. 
This is pretty easy to understand. So the first normal form has two, two requirements. The first is that all of the types, so all the attribute values, have to be atomic or scalars. And the second is that you can't have re repeating groups. Right? So let's say for this, this particular example here, what's the, what's the first violation we see? What's that? Right? What's wrong with C name? It's an array, right? So it's not a scalar. Right? So this would violate the first normal form. And so instead, what you want to do is maybe have it be a single attribute. Right? So you have an atomic value. But now, so if I did this, so let's say that I have now, because you know, my loan with me and DJ Snake had two, two customers, right? me and the other guy. So now I have two columns with, for the customer name. What's the problem with this? What's that? Repeating. Repeating groups, exactly, right? So from a practical standpoint, this seems like a bad idea of how you'd actually implement this, right? Because the, the bottom two loans, they only have one customer name, so they're wasting space for these other fields that are not actually being used. And then for this example here, there's one loan with two customers, but what happens if there's somebody who has three customers, or four, and five, and six, right? Every single time I need to accommodate more, more people, I have to go back and update my schema. So the first normal form basically says that you have to have a single attribute for re re repeated values, and then you just um, end up making an another tuple. Right? So this particular schema here is considered valid w first normal form. Right? Th this, this is pretty, pretty straightforward to understand. So what's, what's an obvious problem with this, though? Uh, I'm not, I'm not this, like, I have a question. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you define that there's some groups that are repeating? Right, so again, like, I need to store multiple values for a particular attribute, so I'm going to represent that by multiple attributes. Right, I have multiple customers that are signed to this loan, then what I'll do is I'll just make an extra, I'll make an extra attribute to represent each, each one of them. Right, so the first customer is me, the second name is DJ Snake, and then so forth for all the others. His question is, if, if the third C name was not there, would this still be considered repeating groups? Yes. So then you can only kind of see this from like your perspective of the user, like the computer, what I'm able to determine. Like, right, so his question is, um, is this something that we as, the, as a human, as the actual person building the, designing the database, is this something we have to reason about and the computer can't do this for this? Absolutely. So, I can easily make this, this table in Postgres or any relational database, and it's fine. The database system will only enforce the things that it can enforce. This is sort of a high-level guidance, sort of a theoretical guidance of how we actually want to design a database. But yeah, the database system can, can store this without any problems. Now, I, I will say also now, again, this is from a sort of theoretical purist point of view, this is a bad thing. You don't want to do this. In practice, many database systems actually now support array types. It's, I think at this point it might be in the SQL standard. It, might, it may or may not be. But in Postgres, you can easily define an array type. So this is actually valid. Uh, it would be valid SQL to put this in. But again, from a theoretical standpoint, it violates the first normal form. But in practice, maybe that's OK. OK, so uh, my question was, when we went to this, to this schema here, I said this is valid first normal form. But what's, what's an obvious problem? Redundancy, absolutely, right? So we have me and DJ Snake are in the single loan, and we're, we're repeating the loan amount. And then we have the, the branch name of the bank and the amount of assets that they have, and that's being stored redundantly as well. So we can now refine this even further in the second normal, second normal form. So in the first normal form, I didn't care about any of the functional dependencies, right? I just cared about whether things were atomic and things didn't have repeating groups. Now to go in the second normal form, I actually have to reason about my, my, my functional dependencies. And for this, we're going to say that to be in the second normal form, you have to be in the first normal form, obviously, so everything has to be atomic, and you can't have any repeating groups. But then you have to say any non-key attributes uh, will have to fully depend on the candidate key for the relation. So let's go through an example of what I mean by this. So say this functional dependency down here. We have loan ID implies the amount and the branch of the bank that, that made the loan. So 
what we'll do is now we can decompose our single relation into multiple relations where the loan ID is being used as the, this is the join key to go from the first relation to the second relation. So now all of the data that, that uh, the loan ID implies based on the functional dependency is now stored in this, in this single relation here. Right, so now I actually don't repeat the, uh, before I was here, and I was repeating the, the amount of the loan. And now when I do this decomposition, now the loan amount is only stored once. Right, there, there's, there's no more redundancy. And then we can apply th this again for the, the, the second function dependency, where you have the branch name implies the assets. And again, so here we see in our assets field, where we're repeating the, the, the total amount that the bank has multiple times, so we, now we can decompose this and split it up. So now we have sort of the, the bank table that has this, the single branch name and the assets. And then we have a sort of cross-reference table that will go from the, the bank name and the loan ID to, to the loan. So this is considered valid uh, second normal form because of this. We say that the non-key attributes fully depend on the candidate key. Right? So we have a non-key attribute here, assets, and that depends on, on the candidate key there. The middle one's a bit more complicated, but same over here. The branch name and the amount depends on the loan ID, and it's stored separately there. So this, again, when I said earlier that the, the second normal form is, is, is good enough, right? This is, this is good enough. It's pretty close. Yes? Um, when you say non-key attributes, so does that mean that the name and loan ID are foreign keys to all the I mean that they're uh, candidate keys. No, we're not really talking about foreign keys. So, like, so take, take the first function dependency. Branch name implies assets, right? Branch name is the candidate key because for this, in this relation because with, that, with a single branch name, I can get all the information I need from that relation. Right? It's only one other attribute, assets. So everything, that, that, that's sound there. Okay, so there is no candidate key for R. Correct, yes. Because there's nothing in the functional dependency that really implies how we should actually maintain customer name and the branch name and loan ID together. Yeah, we'll get, yep. And that wouldn't be, yes, but now, you, now you'd go into a, another normal form, right? At this point, again, the, the basic rule says we have to do this. This is valid. There's obviously, you know, again, you're right. We can, we can fix this thing because we're repeating the branch name here, right? Uh, but now when we do this refinement, now we're going to a lower level. Right? And again, this is what I was sort of saying from uh, that the second normal form is often just good enough because this is not perfect, this is not great, but this is not the end of the world if we had this. Right? So rather than jumping to the third normal form, I want to jump l one level lower and do the Boyce Cod normal form, BCNF, because then we'll see what the issue is with BCNF and how, by going back up, we avoid that problem. All right, so just bear with me. Okay, so in BCNF, we're going to guarantee that we have no redundancies like we saw under 2NF, um, and then we're not going to have any lossless joins, but we're not going to be dependency preserving. And so we can mathematically define Boyce cod normal form to say it'll be, if you have a relation R with a functional dependency set of F, we can say that it's in Boyce cod normal form if for all non-trivial functional dependencies in the closure on F, uh, then, then the, 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 the left-hand side will be a super key on, on that relation. So non-trivial functional dependency may say things like, you know, X implies X. That would, that would be a trivial one. X implies another attribute, X implies Y, that's considered non-trivial. So if we compute our closure, and then for all of these non-trivial function dependencies, if the is an X that, that is the super key for that relation, meaning I can get all the attributes for that relation just by having that one single value, then I, I will be considered in Boyce cod normal form. That's very dry. That's, that's sort, of, sort, of, uh, sort of unpack. So let's walk through an example. All right, so let's keep it really, really simple. So we have a single relation R. It has three attributes, A, B, and C. And then we have two functional dependencies. A implies B, and B implies C. So the first thing we want to do is compute the, the closure of, of F, right? which again, we use Armstrong's axioms to explode this. 
Um, and then for each of those, we can then examine them to see whether uh, the non-trivial attribute is the super key. So the first one, A implies B. We know if we have A implies B, we can get all the other attributes in, in our relation, so therefore, right? Because if you have A, then you can get B. If you have B, then you can get C. So you have A, you can get the other two. Right? So A is a super key. Same thing for A implies C, right? We already showed in the last step that it was a super key. But this last one here, B implies C, you can't get A from B, so therefore B is not a super key, and therefore this particular relation is not in, in BCNF. Because right? again, you look at the functional dependencies, and for anything on the, the left-hand side, uh, if you can't get, if it's not a super key in that relation, then it's not BCNF. So now to put it in BCNF, you do, you, you can do decomposition. So now I take that same relation R, and now I'm going to split it to subrelations, R1 and R2. And now I want to check to see whether the, the total schema R1, the, the total schema that is comprised of R1 and R2 is in BCNF. I'm going to check R1 and R2 individually. Right? So the first one for R1, I take the closure on F, and then for all the non-trivial de functional dependencies, I check to see whether they're the, the, the left-hand side is a super key. So for R1, we just have A and B, and with the functional dependency A implies B, we can get, you know, obviously we can get B, so we're, we're covered here. So A is a super key on R1. So this is okay. Now we check R2. Uh, B implies C. B, the B is therefore a super key. Therefore, for both relations R1 and R2, they're both valid BCNF schemas, so therefore the total database is in BCNF form. Yes? How do you decide which attribute to split on? His question is, how do you decide what attribute to split on? Two slides. We'll get there. Right? As, as, this is just showing you how to check to see whether a schema is in, is in BCNF. <coughs> okay. So... More formally, we can say that if we want to, if we're given a schema R and a set of functional dependencies, we can always de decompose it into sort of subrelations, and those subrelations will always be in BCNF form, and we can guarantee that the decompositions are lossless. Meaning, if we take the natural join on all our subrelations and put everything back together, we'll always get the uh, we'll always get the, the original original uh, table. But some BCNF decompositions, as we'll see in a second may end up losing uh, dependencies. Right? Maybe we said that dependency preservation meant that for a given functional dependency, all of the attributes that are involved in it can be found in a single relation. If you span multiple relations, then, then it's considered you're losing the dependency. So the algorithm to actually compute this is pretty straightforward. I'm not going to go through you know, line by line here to say you know, what exactly is going on, but I'll walk through an example to make this more clear. But the basic idea is that you're going to first compute the closure on, the, on F, and then you're going to put all the relations you have in your database, which at the beginning is just a single relation, you throw it in this, in this set called of result, and then you just keep iterating recursively over the result set, and you'll find any relation that's not in BCNF, and then you'll decompose it into subrelations, and, but the, and you'll, split it on the, uh, you'll split it on a function dependency that is covered in, in just one of them, and then where that, the left-hand side is not the super key. And then what you end up at the end is two subrelations from your original relation R that you were in this sort of iteration, where the, the first one will include the right-hand side of the functional dependency that you split on, and then the other one will not include that. that. And then so that means when you take the union of these two together uh, and put it back in the result set, now you're adding... You're, you're adding uh, you're adding uh, relations or schemas or relations that are now in BCNF form. And you just keep doing that for all your, all your relations until you get down to, to the bare form. So in this case here, when you split, uh, when you decompose your relation, one of them will be in B BCNF, the other one may not be. So you've got to come back and recursively apply the same decomposition algorithm on again. And you keep doing this until you can't do it anymore, and now you're considered in, in BCNF. So let's walk through an example, because this, this is a bit dry. So I have a single relation, and now we're going to have th four attributes. We're going to have the name, social security number, the phone, and, and the city. And so for this, we see obviously that we have redundant information because in our universal schema, 
because my name is repeated multiple times because I have multiple phone numbers, which is not true, but, and then the DJ Little Fame, he's repeated multiple times because he has multiple phone numbers as well. So we see a lot of redundant information here. So the first thing we're going to do is take our function dependency, social security number implies name and city, and we compute the closure on this, which is just generating the, the sort of more basic forms. Social security implies name, social security implies city, and social security number implies name and city together. So and then now with, with the closure, we, we look at our, our the, the, the relations in our result set. In this case, at the very beginning, it's just R because we haven't done any decomposition yet. And then we're going to choose to split, uh, split it up or decompose it into subrelations based on which, uh, based on which attributes in the functional dependency is not a super key. So in this case here, social security number implies name and city. We know that social security number cannot get us the phone number. So what we're going to end up doing is, is split the uh, relation based on their social security number, where one relation will have the things that, are care that can be taken care of by the, the, the super key, social security number, name, and city. And then the other one will have the thing that can't be taken care of by social security number. So that's social security, social security number and phone number. Right? And so now again, so the first one, R1, will have names, social security number, and city, and the second one will have social security number and phone. And then you end up with subrelations like this. And then now also, too, I can define what the uh, primary key is for, for our relations, because I know that in, in the case of R1, for a given social security number, it has to imply the name of the city, and therefore it's a super key. So therefore, that can be our primary key. And then in the second relation, social security number and phone number have to be unique for, for in the entire relation. So therefore, the two together can be the, 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 uh, the, the primary key. We're not even defining foreign keys here, but it's sort of implicit because the social security number in R1 has a foreign key relationship with the social security number in R2. So now in this case here, we have two subrelations. And then we want to go and check to see whether they're in BCNF. And in this case here, right, we said that we had to check to see that the, the super key for each, uh, each relation, or sorry, each, you know, the, the, the left-hand side of the functional dependency in each relation can get us all the information that we need, and therefore it's a super key. So in this, again, the first one, social security number, gives us the other two attributes, and the other one, social security number and phone number get us, if you had the two of them together, you get everything, because there's only two attributes. We can also now check to see whether we're, we're lossless, right? We join these two together, we get back the, 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 same, the, 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 same, the same table. And then we also can check to see whether we have any anomalies here. Could we have any update, insert, or delete anomalies from this? Yes or no? All right, so what's an update anomaly? Update anomaly is what? That you could, you could modify, if values repeat multiple times, and therefore, if you need to update all of the values, you, know, you have to update multiple tuples. Right? We don't have that really problem here. Like, and, and this is with also in the sing, single, single relation. So if we update social security number in the, um, in the first table, then we're fine there. In the second table, it'll implicitly update everything else. Uh, we can't have any delete anomalies, meaning I can delete all my phone numbers, and I, still, I don't delete the people. And then for insert anomalies, I can insert a person without having to require them to have a, a phone number. So we don't have any of those anomalies. So this is considered invalid BCNF. So again, it seems sort of obvious, right? We said that we couldn't have uh, an array type for, for an attribute. So therefore, we had to break it up into to subrelations. And then we didn't want to have the redundant you know, name information for, for all these different phone numbers. So we broke the phone number out into a separate subrelation. And then, lo and behold, we end up being in BCNF for, for what seems like an, an obvious thing to do. Yes? Uh, why is updating the social security number in the second relation not an update anomaly? Don't you lose, like, one of the phone numbers and lose its relation to that person? Yeah, but the, it's, there's no function dependency defining that um, there's no functional dependency defining that the, um, the social security number between two tuples has to be exactly the same, right? The, 
there's no, we're not defining foreign keys, but the foreign key would say you can't have a phone number, you can't have a social security number here that isn't in this one, right? But there's nothing within that relation to say you wouldn't have this problem. All right, so what's the, here's, so let's look at a, a contrived example uh, of where you can have a problem with BCNF. So let's say we have a, a really, really simple database of a company that sells products. And in our relation, we're going to have the item that they're selling, the company that produces it, and the category that the item exists. And let's say we have two functional dependencies where an item implies the company. So therefore, only one company can sell a particular item. Uh, or sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. An item can only be sold by one company. But then I have another functional dependency that says the company and the category implies what item uh, they're selling. We'll see in a, in, when I actually show the schema or actually the actual database instance for these. It seems kind of weird, but again, from, a, from the relational model, this functional dependency, the second one is actually valid. It may not be what your application wants, but it'll produce the anomaly or the problem that we can have with BCNF. So for this, we're going to find that the super key is going to be the item and category. Because if you have the item, then you can get the company. And then if you have the category, you can get the category. Right? So that, that's our super key for this relation. So say now we want to decompose it to now put it into BCNF, where we now split up the item and get, get the company, and the item gives us the, the category, like this. So now when I have my subrelations like this, 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 is, this is valid for, for BCNF because uh, we'll be able to enforce all of the functional dependencies that are within a single relation. Uh, it's lossless, meaning we put the two back together, we'll, we'll get the same data. But we actually can't enforce this functional dependency over here because now it spans two relations. Right? So BCNF is, is not always uh, dependency preserving. So this is, this is fine for us. Again, for all the local functional dependencies are the things that are co covered within a single relation. Uh, but when we actually join it back together, this is still valid from the, we didn't get any information loss. We still have all the tuples we expect to get. But the difference is now that we, we would violate the functional dependency that was originally defined on the, on, on the relation. So this is basically saying that like, you can break things up and the individual relations are, are fine and you'll be able to enforce the, the, the functional dependencies. But when you put things together, your universal schema may end up violating the functional dependency that shouldn't have been violated in the first place. This is sort of weird, right? It's, it's just the basic idea to understand is when you, when, you, when you join things back together, you don't lose information, but you may end up violating a functional dependency. And that's different than losing a functional dependency uh, that we saw in BCNF, right? You would lose it if you can't span multiple relations. And the reason why that matters is because when you put it back together, you, you, you end up with technically in, an incorrect database state. All right, so sort of to say this again in a, in a more formal way, we started with the relation R and its, and its functional dependency set, and then we'll, we'll use that simple algorithm to decompose it into subrelations, and each of those subrelations is going to have their own functional dependency set, our local functional dependency set. And then within that, within a single relation and its functional dependency set, we can guarantee that we have a valid database instance. But then we can also reconstruct R by doing natural joins to put it back into the correct state as it was. It's, not, it's, not a, it's a lossless join. We don't have any garbage data. But we actually can't reconstruct the functional dependency set. Right? Our database instance that after the join would end up violating it. So this is a problem with BCNF because it's, it's too restrictive of, of, of how you're decomposing things based on the rules. And so this is what the third normal form allows. So the third normal form will actually preserve our functional dependencies, uh, both the local ones and the global ones. But we ain't, may end up having some anomalies because we're going to have redundant data. And so we can define this more formally to say we have a relation R with a functional dependency at F. We can say that it's in third normal form if for every, uh, every functional dependency in our closure, that functional dependency is either trivial, right, meaning x implies x, or x will be the super key 
or Y will be part of the candidate key. And again, everyone's glossing over, uh, your eyes are glazing over as I tell you this. Let's walk through an example and uh, both on the slides and through Postgres and hopefully th this, this will become more obvious. So the algorithm we're going to use to decompose a relation into uh, third normal form is slightly different than we saw with BCNF. With BCNF, we sort of took every relation, recursively applied our, our decomposition on them to break, keep breaking them up. The idea with, uh, with third normal form is that we're going to start with nothing, and then we're going to build relations by uh, figuring, out which ones, figuring out which ones can be, can be covered by the different functional dependencies that we have in our canonical cover. Right, again, the canonical cover was the minimum set of functional dependencies that you can have that will satisfy the, so the provided set of functional dependencies. And so if we end up with a, uh, a result as, as we build out our, our relations that is not considered lossless, then we just add another relation with the appropriate keys so that when we join things back together, we end up with the, 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 the correct result that we're looking for. All right, so let's walk through an example. So, Again, in the first step, you compute the canonical cover, and then this was just, again, applying the Armstrong's axioms to decide how to reduce it down to its minimal form. For this example, we're using, again, A, B, C, uh, where A implies B, B implies C. The canonical cover is just the same thing, right? There's, there's, there's no reduction you can do for this. So now what we're going to do, we're going to split R based on its functional dependencies. So we'll select the first functional dependency, A implies B, and we'll say that the, we'll build a relation that can cover that, and then for B implies C, we'll build a second relation that covers that. So now our schema looks like this. So this ensures now that we, we enforce all our dependencies uh, and that when we join them together, they'll, they'll also be enforced. But now the problem is that when you actually do the join to check to see whether it's lossless, you end up with more garbage data. Right? You have three tuples that did not exist in the original universal schema. So the algorithm says the way to rectify this is that you now need to add another relation that contains the, uh, the keys that you want to join on that are not being covered by the, 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 these functional dependencies. So in this case here, it'll be a third relation where A, we have A and C together, so that now when you join all three together, you end up with the, the correct the, the, the correct state of the, of the database. And then this is considered in valid third normal form. So we have redundant information, right? We have now a additional relation with the values of A and C. And technically, you know, this is duplicating the values A in the first relation and the values in C in the second relation. But we need this so that when we combine things back together, we get back a, a lossless join. So Again, the difference between 3NF and B, BCNF is we will have redundant information in 3NF, uh, but, we'll still, and, but we'll be able to guarantee that all our, our, our dependencies are preserved. So this is trivial to, to, to test with in, in something like Postgres. All right? Can everyone see this? Right, so I have... Um, I have my first relation, right, has three tuples, R1, R2, R3. And then I have my, my second relation that has BA1, BA2, BA3, and then all the values for C for them, right? So now when I, um, when I do a natural join between these two guys, I'm actually getting uh, incorrect results because I had four, four tuples before, and what I'm missing now is the, the, the second entry for A2 uh, because it's not being captured in, in, in my other guys. So now if I add another natural join, or I say select star from R3, if I add that third relation that I talked about, um, actually, I think we're missing a tuple too, right? Insert into... Um, R1 values, A2, B2. So now when I do my natural join, 
with our three, right, we, we get the four rows that we, we, we got from the original decomposition. So again, natural drawing is just matching up the, 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 the tuples based on, the, on, the, on the, the names, right? In R1, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a column called A, in R2, there's, sorry, in R1, there's a column called B, in R2, there's a column called B, and just matches the names and does the join based on those. And I, I didn't have to actually define any foreign keys. Okay. So, just to, uh, to summarize what we've, we've covered is that in, with B, C, and F, you're not going to have any anomalies, uh, but you may end up losing some functional dependencies, and in practice, this is what you want. In 3 and F, you keep all your functional dependencies, but you may have some redundant information, so you may have some anomalies. Yes. Yes. Right, so the original table had this. It's, so it's, from the, sort of the schema standpoint, it's still valid because if I have a value of A, then I get the same value of B. So again, relational model has no, it's, it's unordered sets. So you can have duplicates. There's no distinct tuples, right? You want to do distinct tuples, you add this, this distinct clause, clause in your SQL statement, right? So it has to do when, when you put it back together, you end up getting more than you actually should, which is allowed because uh, you're, not, you're not joining on the C that you're missing. We are only actually losing on the relation, right? Like just losing the last entry, the last row in first table. If we delete A, Q, B, A, Q, we are going to lose like Right, but the, you, from a theoretical standpoint, yes. Sorry, so from, from, from an applied standpoint, yes. From a theoretical standpoint, there, there should be two tuples. In reality, you're right. It, it, they're, they're the same, so they're redundant. Okay. All right, so again, the, the, the BCNF is what you probably want to strive for when you design your database application. Uh, three and a half is usually what you get, though, when you take your ER diagram or UML diagram to design your database and just write it out to, to, to SQL. Right? You sort of get this for free. So the dirty secret about the normal forms is that, as far as I know, uh, this is not how people actually design databases. Right? Nobody says, all right, here's, here's the function dependencies for our application. Let's bust out the textbook and look at uh, the algorithm to decompose these things into a voice cloud normal form. Nobody does this. Um, there's been a ton of literature, and every database class that you could ever take at any university, they will spend a lot of time on uh, the normal forms and things like that. I'm guilty of this because I just you know, spent an hour teaching you this, uh, plus functional dependencies last class. So in academia, people, you know, Database professors think that normal forms are, you know, the greatest thing ever, and of course, this is exactly what you want to do, right? But in practice, nobody actually does this. Um, I've yet to have a student come back to me and say, like, oh, yeah, thank God you taught me how to do decompositions, right? Like, because we totally had to use this. Um, and instead, what you see is that people don't think in terms of functional dependencies like this, or, or these normal forms. You actually think about, instead, uh, in terms of sort of object-oriented programming, because you, this is what you're going to end up actually how you're going to implement your application, right? So if you've ever done any development using any of these web frameworks, Django, Ruby on Rails, Node.js, Hibernate is not necessarily a web framework, but it's a, it's a library to talk to the database. In these, in these application frameworks, you end up defining objects in, you know, Python code, Ruby code, Java code, whatever, and the object relational mapping library converts them into the underlying SQL statements to create your database. And so at no point do you ever go look and see, well, what is my, what normal form is my database in? Because you don't care, because you're writing your things in terms, terms of objects. So this is sort of one of the main motivations for the NoSQL systems. So it's a well-known problem to map a object-oriented program to a relational database is non-trivial. Right, because I said in the beginning you couldn't have uh, array types, but it's very com common in objects to have arrays. 
And so there was a big movement for object-oriented databases in the late 1980s, early 1990s. There was a bunch of startups that did a bunch of these kind of systems. You've never heard of any of them because they're all gone. Uh, but this basic idea came up again in the late, in the late 1990s and early 2000s because there was all these XML databases. And then now, you know, 10 years ago, all these JSON databases came out, these document databases. And they're basically making the same argument that people as programmers don't write programs thinking about normal forms. You write in terms of objects, and you want your database to store objects. So this is essentially what led to the NoSQL systems. So one of the key tenets in the, for the NoSQL movement is that they argued that joins were slow to do, uh, so therefore you want to denormalize all your tables. You don't want to do the decomposition that I just showed you to break it off into subtables, because every single time you've got to put an object back together, you have to join them and stitch everything back up in memory in your program. Right? And if you're, if you're if your ORM, your, the object relational mapping library you're using in your application framework, maybe it's smart enough to know that, oh, I can do this as a join, versus like having to do multiple queries to go collect all the data you need in your object. So when the, so the web sort of took off in the early 2000s, people actually started needing what I call a high performance database system. They needed a database system that, that could sustain a lot of operations, a lot of users accessing the website all at the same time. And if you're now, you know, if you have a complex application and you're hanging out in voice code normal form, then to reconstruct an object for something in your application would be a lot of joins and could potentially be very expensive. So there's two things about the NoSQL movement. We'll, we'll cover the first one now, but we'll cover the, the next one later when we talk about transactions. Uh, but I'll say, like, later on, you'll see that they'll, not only will they drop protections for your, the integrity of your database by denormalizing, they'll drop protections for actually doing updates and modifications by not providing you transactions. Uh, I can, you know, there's justifications for, for making me both these assumptions, but they sort of claim that, like, oh, of course you want to do this. You never want to use transactions, right, which is not, not true. And the same thing, you, you, they would say, oh, normalizing your database is a bad idea. Relational model is a bad thing. It's not true. There's some cases where they are actually better, and some cases where the relational model would, would be better for both of these. So the document databases that come out in the last 10 years or so, uh, the, the one that you're probably most familiar with is MongoDB, uh, right? And so when I say, again, as we said in the second lecture, the way to think about a document database is not in terms of Microsoft Word files or PDFs. Think of it as a JSON object or, or an XML file. And so the first version of MongoDB didn't actually support joins. And more recently, they, they, in like the last year or two, they added server-side joins. But it used to be, they would argue that the way you actually want to join data together is, is just denormalize everything and nest everything together inside of a single JSON object so that when you want to go fetch the thing you need for your application, it's one call to the database to go get everything you need. Right? You don't have to do a join. If you, if you end up needing to do a join, they would say you have, to, you have to write your join on the application code, meaning you basically write a for loop to iterate over objects and go grab them in multiple requests. We'll cover this later on, but that's always a bad idea because I guarantee you in your, in your JavaScript application would not be able to write a join as efficient as the one that the Oracle guys wrote in, in their database system in C++. Right? But, it, but that's, that's, that's beside the point. All right, so again, they're going to argue that you want to do what are called pre-joins on your collections by just embedding the objects inside of each other. And again, MongoDB is, is probably the most famous one. MarkLogic was an XML database that came out in the early 2000s. That sort of is the precursor to all these things. RavenDB is, an, is a document database for Windows. Couchbase is the former MenBase, which is the former CouchDB. Right, it's gone through a bunch of different names. Uh, and then RethinkDB was another famous, somewhat famous database system. If you, if you read Hacker News, they would always go crazy about this one. They, they went bankrupt last year, but now it's actually open source. Um, think of RethinkDB. RethinkDB was sort of being pitched as a better written version of MongoDB. Um, at the time, maybe that was true, but maybe not so much anymore. All right, so let's look at, look at an example here. So if we go now, say, say in the voice code normal form, I'm going to model an application where a customer has orders and order has order items. Think again, your Amazon account you have an Amazon account, that's their customer account. You make purchases, which are orders, and then within each order, you buy different items. So in voice code normal form, you would, you would model it like this, where you would have the sort of se again, separate relations to represent each of these entities, 
And then inside the relation, you would have the keys you need to, from your decomposition, to be able to join things back together to get back to the original, the original universal schema. So if you wanted to get now a single customer record and its order and all the items that they bought, you would do a three-way join between these two relations. Or sorry, three, three relations. And that'll get, get you back the data that you need. In the, uh, in the MongoDB world, the document database document model world, they say what you really want to do is have a single customer object. And inside that object, you're going to have an array that has all your orders. And then for each of those orders, you would have all your order items. What is this? What normal form is this? What's that? Sorry, say it. Yeah, it's actually sort of worse than the first normal form because you have an array, right? So, yes, it's, it's technically first normal form, but, but a little bit lower. All right, again, if you think about this, when you actually look at the JSON object, here now I'm storing like the item ID and the price inside, inside of an object, which is inside of an array, and that's inside of the order array, right? And so you have, again, this, this sort of nesting going on. So now let's say that uh, I also want to record information like what, you know, what item was bought, uh, what, what sort of metadata it had about it. I need, need to either embed that inside of the inner object or store that in, a, in another relation, right? So they would argue that this, this is the, the right way to go. Uh, and I would actually agree. In some cases, maybe not for this particular example, for some cases, storing your data this way physically is the right way to do this. What's the keyword I just said there? Physically. Correct, yes. So the document data model sort of blurs the line or, or the separation between the logical layer and the physical layer. Right? So not using joins is, is, is not necessarily a byproduct of using the document model. Like you can use the document data system and decompose your, 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 your collections, or as what they call them, or relations, into BCNF, and that's just fine. Whether the system supports joins or not depends on engineering, right? MongoDB now supports inner joins. Uh, but to, to, they would claim that denormalizing on the document data model actually makes everything more natural to, 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 to query. And I would, I would disagree on that point. Because now what you end up doing, you end up baking in your application code the physical layout of how your data is actually being stored. Because no longer do you have a collection or relation for the, for the customer and a separate you know, collection or relation for the orders. They're now embedded inside of each other. Right? And there's actually nothing in the relational model that prevents you from storing it physically in the way that they prescribe. And I agree. That's actually the way they, they propose here is actually better. If I want to get, a, for a single customer, their, all their orders and order items, it's a single fetch into, onto disk or memory, or whatever it is, and all this data is contiguous to each other. If I had to do a join where these things are physically stored in different locations, uh, or say even on a, uh, you know, say a distributed database on different machines, then I'm sending requests to different machines and then, and then sort of putting it all back together. But if I can pack these guys together on a single disk page, then it's one seek to go get the data I need, if you're assuming an old hard drive, and then you fetch that one page and voila, everything's actually there. But it's hard to do that, to, to make a decision whether to do this or not, if you're baking in the logical layer in your application code that this thing has to be embedded inside of this thing and that thing has to be embedded inside of this thing. Right? So if you go back to this sort of JSON example that I had here, the, roughly the MongoDB query syntax you would actually use to execute this, query to do a lookup to find the item that somebody bought with item XXX, you, you would write it as you, uh, a lookup on the customer's collection and do a find where orders.order items, um, actually, they we're missing item ID there, but then you look up the item ID. So now, let's say if I, if I decide later on that I want to not denormalize my relations and I want to break out the order items and put it some, separate, separate someone else, right? I can do this for uh, software engineering reasons, like it's easier to maintain the code that I think it actually can. Uh, uh, store different order items, right? It may be not always I want to store order items for every order, or maybe I want to have, for whatever reason, another something else create more order items. Uh, but I also could do this for hardware reasons. Maybe I want to put the order items uh, 
collection or relation on a machine with a really, really fast disk or a lot of RAM. I, 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 I want to put the other relation on a slower machine because maybe I, I don't update it that often. I can't do that easily because I'm baking in my application code the actual schema, the logical schema, which dictates the physical schema. So now let's say again, if, if I if I if I now denormal, sorry, if I normalize my 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 database and I again move order items out, I have to go back in all my code and update everything to now maybe not do dot order items. I got to change it now to actually point at the collection that I'm looking for. But under the relational model with SQL, to do that three-way join. I just define what the answer I want. And at no point does this actually specify anything about how the data is actually being stored. So the, the customers table, the orders table, and the order items table, they could be on separate machines. I don't know, I don't care. Or actually I could do, what I could do is I could pack together within a single page, a single record, the, the nesting, the physical nesting where the for each record, I have my orders, and then inside of them, I have all the items that they purchased. So this is not a new idea. This, this, this idea of, of, de of having the logical normalization, but the physical denormalization to speed things up. As we'll see in a lot of cases throughout the semester, the IBM guys thought about this in the 1970s with System R. Right? They actually did it the way I'm showing here in the very first database system they built in 1974. Turns out this is a huge pain in the ass to actually maintain, and they end up abandoning this later on. Uh, but it shows up now in, in newer papers. So the Google Spanner paper, right? If you're familiar with Sp Google Spanner system, right? It's a, it's a relational database system. They have a way to pack together related fields in the same page so that when you want to do a join to go get the nested information, it's one page fetch to go to get the thing you need. Right? So it's an old idea that's been around for a long time, but now it's actually showing up in, in, in newer systems. And it's difficult to do this in, in a NoSQL system if you don't have that abstraction between the logical layer and the physical layer. So is this clear? Again, the IBM System R project was very, very interesting. It's crazy how much stuff that like, newer systems are doing now if you go back and read the annals or the, the interviews with the, the early IBM researchers, they tried, a, they tried everything. And a lot of it didn't work because the hardware couldn't, couldn't really support it back then and machines were really expensive and it was, it was hard to maintain, but now people can try these things uh, in their newer systems. Okay? All right, so what do I want to say about normal forms? They exist. You should know about them. You should be able to reason about them. Uh, and they're important, again, for you to be able to reason about maybe if the performance of a particular database is not doing what you think it should do, you, you, know, you could look at the design and make decisions about whether we should you know, denormalize things or normalize things. Typically, that doesn't happen that often because if you break up a table into multiple tables, uh, I guess you can hide it with views. You may have to go back and change your application. But you, you, you can hide that with, with views. So maybe that's not a big deal. Um, and then again, the, there, there's really no magic formula that, that I can provide for you or no magic guideline you can, you can walk through and say, what's the right amount of normalization for your application? It typically depends. And again, as far as I know, when people design applications, nobody says, I want to reach BCNF. Let's make sure we get that. You basically just design it in Django and Ruby on Rails, and then whatever you end up with is, is good enough. OK? All right, so that's it for theory for this course. Uh, sort of true. We'll talk about concurrent control theory when we talk about transactions, but that's actually, I don't want to say useful theory, but that's actually good stuff, right? That, that's important to know. Uh, but from this point on, starting on class on Monday, we're really going to start focusing on now the, the sort of building from the ground up what you actually need to build a database system. So we're going to talk about, talk about storage management. And this can be related to the first project that, we, that went out on Monday. Um, and we're going to go through sort of step by step and say, here's all the things you need to build up to build sort of a classic disk-based database system. So the other thing I'll point out, too, also, is that the first homework assignment, the SQL queries, is due tonight at midnight. And then after class, we will be releasing the second homework assignment, which is a 
pencil and paper assignment on, on the normal forms, basically walking through the algorithms to understand everything we talked about. And for this, you'll submit your PDF on Gradescope. So all of you, if, if you're enrolled in the course, you should have gotten an a email last night saying that you're now part of the Grade course course, or Gradescope course. Uh, if you did not get this email and you think you should be, should, you, know, you think you are enrolled in the course, then send me an email and we can add you. Okay? And the idea of a grade scope is basically you upload your PDF and then you'll get your grade and, 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 and uh, assessment of your homework through, through the website. Okay? Any questions? Does anybody have any problems with the, getting the Project One to actually build on their machine? You did. You want to ask a question? Yes. This one. This one. So her question is, uh, I said that in the case of this example here, uh, from a, an efficiency standpoint, it may actually be better to store the, the records packed together in a page. But then, the, 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 so, so that's true. It depends, obviously, on certain things, right? Like, if I have, uh, you know, in this case here, I only have one order. But what do I do if I have multiple orders and that maybe I have to pre-allocate space to make sure I can insert it in? Otherwise, I have to copy the whole thing out and create a new entry. So I'm not saying this is magically always the right thing to do, but it does have the advantage that you don't, you don't have to do multiple page fetches. But then what's your second part of the question? Your question is, is there a way to combine the logical normalization with the physical normalization? Yes. So I, I think what you're trying to say is um, there are benefits, there's pros and cons to denormalization versus normalization. Is there a way to do a sort of a hybrid thing where you get the best of both? Is that what you're saying? Yes? Okay. Uh, so I would say writing your queries in a declarative way in SQL gives you the best of both worlds because you don't care how the thing's actually physically stored the database system can make that decision for you. And the database system is always going to be in the best position to figure out what the most efficient way to store your data is because it knows what the data is. And it knows what queries you're going to execute on it. So in this case here, I'm packing these, these, things, these things together, but that may actually be a bad idea. So the data system could decide that it doesn't want to denormalize like this and actually wants, wants to normalize them. But then I don't have to change my SQL query. This work, still works the same. Whereas in the, if I write it in the, 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 the MongoDB query style, I do have to go change it. Yes. The question is, can, can, we, can we normalize at the, can we denormalize at the logical level, but then normalize at the physical level? Can you sort of reverse the two? Yes, it is, but it is possible to support the, the sessions in MongoDB to support SQL. The question is, is it possible for MongoDB to support SQL queries? Uh, yes. Uh, well, they would say no. They, uh, <laughs> No, so actually, so, so a better example. Um, Postgres supports JSON. And actually, most major commercial databases support XML. XML databases were, were a big thing in the early 2000s. So all of them have support, and there's actually support in the SQL standard for XML. Right? And XML, again, you're essentially defining exactly the, 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 the in some ways, the physical layout of your data. Uh, so you, so, 
I think what you're asking is like, can like can you can have a document database run SQL queries on JSON? Is that what you're saying? And the answer is yes, yes. But you would still. Um, I would argue that the less information about the 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 how your data data is being denormalized that you expose in your application, the easier it is for you to actually maintain. Some cases it's unavoidable, right? Like if you have to have uh, you're, if you're splitting tables in two separate things, again, you can hide these things with views in some ways, right? I'm being nebulous because there's no clear answer and you can kind of do anything and everything. And I would say, in my opinion, this is the better way to go, but most people don't write applications writing raw SQL queries. You use an ORM that does it for you. So this all might just be a moot point in the end. But from a, from a again, from a relational purist, this, this is the better way. We can talk more about it offline, okay? All right, any other questions? All right, guys, uh, have a good weekend, and I'll see you on Monday.